let's begin. Um, we will do a review tonight, but Jay is going to handle that tonight. I have to leave town. So if you have any questions about your sim study or any details about EM, I'm pretty sure Jay can work through that with you. Jay Young, how's your memory? Remember all that stuff? I I already knew my report. My book. He will study tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I do the same thing. I wake up every morning and I study stats for about an hour. So work problems, things like that. That's the way I wake up. So okay. Um, today I want to go through crane around. We'll see if we can get through the proof, and then I want to go through the midterm as well. Um, I will kind of mention that I went through. Um, two different grading schemes. I kind of dropped your lowest score. That's my alternative grading scheme. So I went through, I graded everything, and I thought, oh boy, that's not great. So let me look at it again, a little bit different. I dropped your lowest score, retallied it. I thought about doing it again and dropping the next lowest. You know, bring things up. I thought about adding 25 points to everybody's score just to bring it up. So, because I don't like them so low. I really never liked it like in physics class where like the average is 30. You know, it's kind of just heartbreaking. You know, so I don't want that effect. Um, so I did do an alternative grading where I dropped your lowest score and I noticed it doesn't hold the ordering of everything, right? So everybody, you know, if somebody is a really good test taker, you might think they're going to perform uniformly across the questions. They might strategize that way. And if you hear something like, you drop the lowest score, you would have approached it differently. So somebody that got a zero on a problem, but ace the other problems, that's a really good procedure. But if somebody's going to spread their errors all through the exam, which I kind of think is like what you might try to do. Um, I never tried to do that. I used to be a waiter. And if I were ever getting too busy, I would do one thing, I would pick my worst table, and I'd put it all on. So, that's true. <laughs> I didn't want to spread the air across everything, but I'm not sure if that applies to this, but I'm at least sympathetic about it. So what I decided to do is drop the lowest score, give you another score that can only make your score go up. That's guaranteed. You can prove that, probably. Uh, but not necessarily maintain the order. So I put an asterisk in my grade sheet if all of a sudden you went down in the order. And I need to look for that when I'm regrading everything. And so anybody that got an asterisk because they went down under somebody in my grade book, I'll look at very carefully and make sure that the ordering is preserved with whoever that they went under. So that means this. If I looked at two people and I thought under one grading scheme this person got an A and this person got a B, and then I changed the grading scheme and it flipped. I'll give you, and this person now gets an A and that person gets a B, I'll give you both A's. So I'll come up with two different grade sheets, depending on things, give you, draw lines through it. I don't really adhere to the 90, 80, 70 thing because I'm looking for clusters, groupings. So that sort of thing. Are there any questions about that? I was kind of sympathetic because there was all the noise going on during the exam, and realistically, I probably should have just come up with a strategy right then and there. I'll drop your lowest score, so use that information. I wish that I would have said that, so you could have strategized, but I'll be considerate about it and do whatever improves your score. Does that make sense? So the way I feel about it is I'll do anything I can to give you the higher score, and if I can't, there's just nothing I can do about it. It's not on me. So that's the way I feel about it. So, okay. So I, I'm sorry if that appears slightly unfair. I know that it's not entirely uniform, but I will work it out so that you get the benefit of the doubt on it. Okay, good. Um, I noticed that in this new grading scheme where I dropped a score, some people improved 18%. That was the maximum. Some people improved 4%, that was the minimum. So if you are a uniform performer, you're close to the minimum. So if you have high variability and everything, that worked out in your favor. So you lucked out. Um, anyway, just so that everything is disclosed. But again, I'll give you the score that benefits you best. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll have an iterative algorithm when I'm creating. So go back, look at everything. 
you can see if I can justify it. Okay, we'll come and look at those. Um, towards the end, you'll see what I mean. Um, let's just look at this example. This example is in the book. Um, real quickly, I'll just write this down. The mass function looks like this. So lambda to the x, e to the minus lambda, x factorial. So that's our mass function. These are actual probabilities, so I should, probably should put this as PR or something like that. And so these things are bounded between zero and one, and they add up to one. Sometimes people confuse densities, and they think that density measures have to be under one, too. That's just not true. So densities you can go above one, but mass functions can't. Uh, lambda here is positive. I guess it could contain zero, but funny things happen. So oftentimes, if you did have an overabundance of zeros in your model, you might build a mixture model with uh, zero inflation, a point mass on zero. How would you handle that? How would you do your estimation? Just like any mixture model. A point mass is also a density function. So you can do either one. I can put all the mass with some probability on zero, and the rest of the mass maybe on some Poisson model. How would you fit that? Very typically, people will use EM for mixture models to do that. So same sort of idea. Uh, I'll just say lambda is greater than zero. Uh, real quickly, what's the expectation of x? Yeah. What's the variance? So we know a little bit about this one. So this is a pretty hard constraint, but this is a counting model. So the more you count, the more errors you make is kind of the idea here. If you don't like that, that they're exactly the same, there's other counting models out there. And I would say you can probably form those counting models out of this counting model by taking mixtures. So that's how I change my modeling assumptions, I mix them or something. So for instance, if I let gamma be, or sorry, if I let lambda be gamma distributed, and I mix over that and I average across it by taking an integral that turns the Poisson model into a negative binary model. So that's kind of cool. Which has an increased variance compared to its expectation. If you mix over something, you're only going to increase its variability. Okay. If you do ever notice that the expectation or the variance is lower than the expectation, it's definitely not Poisson. So it's probably some sort of a mixture of Poisson's, so it could be a zero inflated sort of model. So you'd be fitting a mixture if you notice an under dispersion when you think about that. Um, okay, real quick, what's the MLE? How would you do it? You take the product, i goes from 1 to n, lambda xi over xi factorial, you're lucky that's not going to come into your calculation because it doesn't, it factorizes away from all the lambdas. So it won't have anything to do with inferring the lambdas. And then you got this part right here. So product this thing together, take the logarithm of everything, take a derivative with respect to lambda, and solve for it. That's the MLE. Anybody do this problem before? Thanks, Mark. No surprise. Exponential thing. So this happens all the time. Uh, kind of like that, central limit theorem governs that, so now all of a sudden we have other properties. So not necessarily the only thing going, but not um, a bad step right there for estimating lambda. We probably have to quantify its variability. Notice also this thing is unbiased. So the expectation of x bar is equal to lambda, so that's kind of a good property. You get that for free. So I don't necessarily think that it's the greatest property in the world, but x bar is equal to lambda half MLE. These are the same things. Is equal to lambda, so it's unbiased. Um, here's another test statistic. S squared. S 
Same as squared is always. This sum is between 1 and n. This is also an unbiased estimator. Just keep in mind the variability is lambda. So this is a weird distribution that I can use these two different statistics to estimate lambda. They're both unbiased estimators. So the expectation of s squared is equal to lambda. And we could probably work through everything and work through the variability of this. That wouldn't be too hard. So everything is just a linear combination. And so you can work through the variance for this. Does anybody know what it is? Variance, sum of the xi's over n. So that's for this part right here. Somebody help me out. Can you almost do it in your head? Lambda over n. So pull the sum outside. That factorizes out. You have an n squared coming over the top. The variance of each xi is lambda. You're summing that up n times. So n lambda in the numerator divided by n squared in the denominator. That's lambda over n. So this is its variance for that statistic. How about for this other one? Variance of s squared. Anybody know? We've got people drawing in the air, so that must be helping. <laughs> Two lambda over is not the maximum. Two lambda over n minus one. This is the first time anybody's taken a stab at it. Anybody else? You're close. It's this. Remember, this is a sigma squared, or sig the sigma four thing over here for a normal model, but sigma squared is like lambda. But let's just say we didn't know this. We could work it out, but it still begs the question, are there other unbiased estimators out there that might have a different variability to them? So we might ask the question of which one of these is better. Kind of depends, you know? But I think that this one looks like it's always better than that. You can verify that. So we don't have any problems when n is equal to 1 or something like that. n is 1, this thing explodes. n is 2, that's a 1, this is dividing that. This is bigger right here, probably. Obviously it depends something on what lambda is, but then I have this 2 in here. That's jacking things up as well. I'm sure there can be some trade-off or some very small data set depending on what lambda is. But would you use that estimator in general? Again, remember, you don't know what lambda is, so you might be thinking about your risks or your variability on average. So we can also form another unbiased estimator. So here's another test statistic, lambda half. Um, I'll call, I'll put this parameter in here, alpha times x bar plus one minus alpha s squared. And you can work out the variability of this because you just take the variance over this. It's a linear operator. You pull out the alphas, square them out. Um, I should probably mention alpha goes between 0 and 1. So I can just kind of reparameterize this. Either cut more weight on this one or more weight on that. Then it's unclear why you would do this. Obviously, if you knew that this was a better estimator, you'd probably not want to put any weight on this. The point being is that there's an infinite collection of unbiased estimators. So there's an infinite collection of them. And we still don't know that there's no more out there that we can't generate, we can't think of. Um, and maybe there's another estimator out there lingering around. So statisticians need some help. So some theory to help them decide if there is a best estimator, can we find it? So in some cases, you can answer this question. Sometimes you have to be a little bit specific about all of this. So keep in mind there's only two reasons, no matter how you're measuring your losses, that an estimator can be bad. Either it's systematically incorrect, i.e. it has some bias, or it jumps all over the place every time I do my sampling. So it's not very stable in terms of its stochasticity. If I were working in the L2 norm, I could decompose that into bias squared plus variance. 
and talk about that stochasticity measure, how much it jumps around on average in terms of the variance. But there's other functions, and we might not know what they are, that kind of measure how things jump around. So if we're willing to get a little bit specific, we might be able to answer this question. But I will say in general, you can't just say what's the best estimator out there. You have to invoke criterion, and under some criteria, that might not be an answerable question, too. There might be other estimators out there, and you don't have any theory that says that your estimator can't be beaten. And so all you're doing is trying to come up with an estimator with good properties, and you're verifying that. But again, if we're willing to get really concrete about this, maybe we can answer a question like, what is the best estimator that's unbiased when I use the L2 loss function? So if you're willing to get really specific, you can answer a question about what is best. If you're not willing to get really specific about it, there could be lots of good answers out there. Just write this question down. Question, which estimator lambda hat is best? This is not an answerable question. Answer, this is not well defined. Even in cases where the question is undefined, you can't always answer the question. But in some simple cases, you can. So here's another question. In the class of unbiased estimators, which has the lowest variance? I'll say estimator. Notice I'm not saying estimate, I'm saying estimator, it's a function. And I'm imagining doing this over and over and over again, going back out into the population. And what's changing? It's the x's, those are the random variables. And so I don't want my answer conditional on those x's. I want to know what happens if I repeat the exercise over and over again. So it does not mean that you necessarily have the best estimator still. It just says, on average, you've got a good estimator. So if you kept doing things over and over again, you're bound to be good sometimes, is what it says. And sometimes not. And I think people forget this. So when people say things like, what possibly went wrong in the prediction? How could we possibly wrong, be wrong? We have all of these guarantees. It doesn't say anything about a specific case. You could get out of that. And that sometimes happens in my simulation studies. I just kind of worry about that one out of 20 where I'm like, am running my sim study on the fly and it's like, well, that can't happen. <laughs> so then we run it again. We haven't had one of those yet. So but it happens every once in a while. I'd say one out of every 20 years or something like that. Terrible simulation space. Not quite like that. Okay, so maybe we can answer this question. Notice this question is prompting you to think about MSE. I.e., think about MSE. I will point out that we're pre specifying the bias level to be unbiased in this analysis. If you wanted to optimize something under a particular loss function, you take that loss function and then try to optimize it in any of the number of ways you know how to optimize. So one such way, if the function is smooth, you can take derivatives, set everything equal to zero, and solve. If the function's not smooth, you might be more sophisticated about that. But again, you get the idea. Let me show you what the frame around the little bit Kramer Rao has a way of sometimes being able to answer this question. So this is the key. So Kramer Rao says this. If I were a statistician back in the 19 whatevers, 
60s, 70s, if I could claim any result and just take it and put my name on it, I understand we don't do that. <laughs> but if I could build a time machine and do it, it might be this one. Um, it probably would be more akin to the metropolis stuff, but I would say if I just wanted a mathematical theorem, something elegant and useful, this one is a contender. So bring it around, get the credit. It says this, variance, and here's where the notation gets a little bit weird. Here's just some estimator. This is not a specific statement about any old estimator. It's talking about the collection of possible estimators. So here's a collection of possible estimators for estimating lambda in the Poisson model. And I might want an arbitrary statement about collections of estimators and talk about theoretically how low their variance could go. So this is not Kramer Rao's lower bound. This is Scotland's lower bound. Let me just tell you what it is. So since I wasn't able to come up with this before Kramer and Rao scooped me, I decided to come up with my own variant bound. It's this. I could prove that. I could give you a proof. We could talk about it for a long time. I can guarantee it. I can get red in the face. I can get angry. It's true. I can be adamant about it. It's totally useless. Everybody knows this. So this is a totally useless lower bound. So nobody will ever give me credit, no matter how red in the face I get. So let's get rid of that. Totally useless. Let's see what Kramer and Brown came up with it for. Sometimes this is usable, sometimes it's not. So there are conditions under whether or not this is a true statement. So we have to write down those conditions. So let me just write down um, what are the conditions right now. This one's pretty obvious. I only want to talk about variances if they exist. So I'm going to say condition one is the variance of whatever estimators I'm talking about for estimating some parameter. I want to say that these are less than infinity. The book writes that what they mean is that if we're going to talk about a variance, a lower bound for a variance, we better be talking about something that exists in the first place. So IE exists. So if I'm working with like a Cauchy distribution, I'm trying to quantify its variance. I get to work really hard, but I'm talking about something that doesn't exist, so I'm wasting my time. So condition two is a little bit more elusive. We'll talk about this condition. It says this, the derivative of the expected value of Wx, whatever this statistic is, and I'll remind you that we're taking an expectation with respect to x given theta. So just the, the typical expectation over whatever generated the data. That this derivative over this expectation can be written this way. Wx f of x given theta dx. So all we did here is if I took this derivative outside and I put it here, this is true. Because that's the definition of the expectation. So this is the derivative of the expectation. The condition says that I can insert this derivative inside of here. This is Fubini's. So I can interchange these. So it's saying Fubini's has to hold. One such time that you would not be able to interchange this is if this integral depended on theta, you wouldn't be able to slide that derivative right across the, inter the integration symbol because there's a theta in there. So think about like a uniform zero theta example where theta is on the boundary. You can't just take the derivative and slide it right across that. It's got to interact with that theta. So that would be a case where Kramer Rao does not apply. So uniform zero theta doesn't have this sort of condition. So we might be asking this question, what's the best estimator out there? And this theory doesn't help us. And it turns out it doesn't. And that's a hard question to answer. So you usually have to invoke classes, certain properties that you want to assure that you want, and then you find the best estimator within that class. So for instance, I might say, 
I want the class of estimators with some prior that's flat, and I'm going to use the L1 loss function, and I'm going to derive something. And we came up with a name for that many months ago. We'll stop giving attribution for that. So, but if you want to credit Josiah, he's just as good as anybody else. So, so that sort of thing. Is that the right prior to use? Why am I using that prior? Those are all questions. So, and we'd have to defend that. So you can't answer any question, just what is best. But you can lock it down into classes, and this tends to do this. So if this condition holds, we can come up with this statement right here. This is going to be the derivative with respect to theta, the expectation of Wx squared divided by the expected value and I'll write it this way. There's a couple different ways you can write this. d theta, the logarithm, and I like the word likelihood because I'm taking a derivative over theta. But if you didn't want to call it a likelihood, I can understand. And you square this thing out right here. Uh, you're obviously taking your expectations over x given theta. So you're operating on this in both. Ways, on x and on theta, so maybe likelihood's not the right word, maybe sampling distribution isn't the right word, but I would say log likelihood, and I think most people do, whatever that function is. This expectation is over the same thing, everything is integrated with respect to the sampling distribution, so I'm assuming the xi's come out of that sampling distribution, and the thetas are the parameters in the model. So this is what it is. Um, let me just ask a question. I said Kramer Rattle helps us to answer questions like this. Where is the bias level expressed in this problem? There must be something about this answer that has to do with bias. Expectation of values. Yeah, so the expectation is here. So there's kind of an implication in here. And so if this was unbiased, this would be theta right here, it would be estimating theta, the model parameters. So when I take a derivative with respect to theta of theta, that's 1. So if the numerator is 1 in this, 1 squared is 1. If the numerator is 1, we're touching unbiased models. If this is something different than theta, then that's establishing the bias level for you. So let's say it's theta plus 2, you know, that was the estimator or whatever then I could end up establishing a bound on variances where the bias level is 2 or something like that. So very typically you'll see this with the 1 in the numerator and that's just the variance bound for unbiased estimators. Um, does anybody know what this is called? This is the Fisher infinite. I should probably say this is the expected Fisher info. If you had data and you're trying to estimate what the variability on something was, you might be able to use this and actually plug data into here and use an empirical estimator. And a lot of people in generalized linear modeling class will do things like that. So they'll actually do this with actual data to estimate what the variance is. So instead of just using the variance of their estimator, they might say, I'm going to use in the class of unbiased estimators, I'm going to make that a 1. And then I'm going to let this be my empirical expectation so that I could calibrate everything. And I'm just going to set everything to be a little bound. So in asymptotic statistics, that's a very popular idea. It can even work. So. Let me just make a few notes about this. The Fisher info can be written a couple different ways. So the Fisher info let's take this to be the definition. So that's our Fisher info. Very typically, we'll call this I theta. So 
that's the, the typical implication for it. I'll point out that if everything was unbiased, this quantity right here, the inverse of this, is maybe has something to do with variability. And in some cases, we might be able to find an estimator that obtains this lower bound. So if we actually are able to find something that obtains this lower bound, I worked out this lower bound. This is the theoretical statement about collections of estimators. And I find an estimator that meets the lower bound. What it means is I can't go out there and find another statistic that drives it down any further. They don't exist, so I can stop looking. So that's kind of nice. Um, if everything is unbiased, the variance, if it matches the lower bound, the variance is the inverse of this. So again, if everything in the collection of unbiased estimators, the variance bound only depends on the inverse of this. If we can find an estimator that meets, meets this, this is the variance, the inverse of the variance. I'll point out, uh, there's some good things about writing it out this way. You know that it's necessarily positive. That's good. Variance is it better be positive. This thing better not go negative. So that's a good thing that it doesn't give you some nonsensical bound. Uh, maybe it gives you zero, but maybe it gives you something positive. So that would be good. Uh, so it's positive. I kind of like that. There's another way you can write this. And I want to point out, this is all the data. So that's my whole collection of data, x1 to xn. I don't think I wrote that down, but I'm presupposing cap x is your collection of data. You can sometimes write it like this. I beta is equal to expectation two derivatives on theta log likelihood. And there's a negative sign right in front of that. Don't forget the negative sign when you take two derivatives. This is negative right here, two derivatives. I oftentimes like to use this form right here because sometimes taking an extra derivative knocks out an extra parameter or something like that. So if I were dealing with a polynomial, if the log likelihood was a polynomial or something like that, taking more derivatives just keeps reducing that polynomial. So a lot of exponential family stuff is like that. The sometimes bit depends on Fubini's. This is if Fubini's applies. I'm sure in one of my previous classes I've done this on the board and worked through the details and shown you explicitly Fubini's has to hold. What I would recommend you do is work through this and just expand everything. See what it is. Do the same thing for this and see when they're equal to each other. And there'll be an extra term involved in this expression than there is in that expression right here. So again, you just taking the derivatives over a log, you know how to do it algebraically. So you'll notice that there's one extra term involved in here. And what you'll be able to show that if Fubini's holds, that term is zero. So I'll let you work through those details. Mahomet. Where did the negative Magic. So it makes them equal to each other. Work them out. That's what I'm saying. Work out on two sides, and you'll notice that they're equal to each other if Fubini's holds. So it's maybe not intuitive that there's a negative sign there, but this thing is negative. We'll work through an example and show you this. But what I'm saying is if you ever come up with this expression right here, if you work through this, and the answer is negative, you made a mistake. How do you know? By looking up here, and then working out these two things are the same. If Fubini's holds. Again, in this discussion, we're going to be able to apply that because Fubini's holds, it's one of our conditions. It's necessary. So I oftentimes work through this. If you ever come up with an answer here and it's negative, you forgot that negative sign, or you made an algebraic error because it's supposed to be positive. Again, I'll ask you work through the um, identity here 
and just show that these two things are equal and show that Fubini's has to hold. So I kind of like that because I'm not going to say Fubini's has to hold up front. I'm just going to work out the two expressions. Again, take the derivative over the log of that. So it's one over that thing. I apply the chain rule to it. I can do the same thing over here. I do it twice. And then I'll notice that there's two terms here. Um, and one of the terms is zero. So again, work through that. Uh, I might ask you on a future exam to show that. So that should be some motivation for you. Here's another case. So if everything is IID, XIs or IID, so this is the important part from f of x given theta, then we can write down this, that this will be equal to I theta. And I can do this for either one of these. It doesn't matter. Both of them that this will apply to is I could just write this down as minus an expectation of two derivatives on theta log f of x given theta. My point is, is that this thing right here is just one data point. not the whole collection. So this is n data points up here. This is one data point, and I can factorize out the n. You can almost see that instantly when you work through this form. It's not as easy to see right here. Keep in mind, if this is all the data, that's a product. Over all the fxi's, I take the logarithm of that, that here turns it into a sum. Linear operator, linear operator, I can pull the sum out front. So I add it up n times. Same thing happens here. So in the IID case, I can substitute that with one data point and throw an n right here. It's not as easy to see in this case because of the, the quadratic. Very easy to see there. So that's why I like the two forms is I can see different things. I also kind of like this form right here when I talk about the second derivative that talks about the curvature of the space. So that's what I learned about in calculus class a long time ago. It's showing me the curvature. So if the curvature is very, very large, <coughs> right here, curvature being large means it's peaky, very peaky. So something without a lot of curvature is pretty flat. So I may have been doing the exact wrong thing with my hands before. So things are very curved. So that is, some, that is expressing low variability. So again, the Fisher information has something to do with the inverse of the variance. So if the curvature is low, i.e. it's flat, then the variance is large. It's on the reciprocal scale. So I can see that in the second derivative form where I can't necessarily see that here. That's enough about that. I think um, we've got five minutes. We should probably do exams. I think what I would like to do next time is come in with the Poisson example and work through the Kramer-Rau lower bound. What I'm going to show you is that the Kramer-Rau lower bound for the Poisson model is lambda over n. So if I plug the Poisson model into this, and I let this be one for the class of unbiased estimators, when I work through this calculation, it will be lambda over n. And one of our variances is already lambda over n, it's this one. So it means that the variance can't be reduced from that statistic. So we could verify that this x bar is better than that just by looking at these variances, but it doesn't guarantee that there's not another statistic out there that has a lower variance. And so because I found a statistic that attains the Kramer Rao lower bound, it means I can stop looking. If Kramer Rao doesn't hold, then you look forever. And that's a good thing. So because if you come up with something that's pretty good and you publish on it, and two years later you find something else that's better, publish it. So that's not that thing to do. So let's look at exams. We'll pick up with this. Yeah.
midterm one, this is midterm two. This is my first grading scheme. My, mid, my mean was 63, so it seems pretty low. Um, I came up with a new grading scheme and it increased things a little bit. So I've got two sets of vectors. A is all four problems are in there. B is I dropped your lowest score. So I'll be thinking about that when I give you a final score. Um, again, I'm not sure. It's not a, like this one-to-one -one sort of relationship. It's to your performance and the exact score. Again, I'm sympathetic. If you did pretty well on all the problems and then I dropped one, it, it only improved you 4% versus somebody that improved 18%. So I'm going to be aware of that. Max. Max. Which one? Yeah. yeah. Max midterm A. Oops, midterm two A ninety five. Wow. So somebody did well. When I readjusted it, it became a hundred. So I do have a couple one hundreds in here. That's what I didn't like about my first scheme. There's always somebody that gets a hundred A. Tells me that the exam is impossible. I didn't find that in the first time. It was the first time in, what did I say, 10 or 11 years I've been doing this, this class, that I haven't seen hundreds. So I think that might be because of the jackhammer, or maybe because I put the EM problem on there and that messed you up, that when you got to the easy problems, you'd already blown all your time or something like that. I suspect that there was some of that stuff. Uh, Min. You sure you want to know? <laughs> 25. 29. This is the same person. So there are a few of these that are really low. So what I want to remind you about is this means you're not good at taking tests in this class. That doesn't necessarily mean you don't know the material or you can't understand it. So what I'd like you to do is take home the exams, redo it all, Turn them in perfectly to me, and I'll say by next Friday. So let me just make a note. Note. Test corrections due. What's not this Friday, but next Friday? I don't even know what day it is. <laughs> it's the 28th. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> May 28th. So please turn those in by then. April. April. What's that? April. Oh, April. Yeah. <clears throat> You'll already be home. <laughs> April 28th. So please turn those in. And I want to see that you can understand this material by the end of the class. And that's the important thing to me. So still safety net. So somebody that got a 30 on the exam could get back 35 more points, that'd be a 65. And I'm gonna guess that's somewhere around the beat. So if you wanna take your grade that might feel like a failing grade and turn it into a B, that's on the table. So I'm gonna guess at this point, probably not everybody can get an A plus in the class. We don't really get A pluses at VT anyway, but you know what I'm saying. So I probably knew that beforehand, but that was all just prior. So now we have a little bit of updated information. Here's the grade. Midterm 2A. There it is. It's hard to tell. His grams suck. So, but you can kind of see some big. So, a bunch of people greater than 70. So I would say if you're in this group, pretty good. So not too bad. So not a ton to worry about. I totally get it. If you get a 71, you're going to be like, oh shucks. So and maybe you're one of those unfortunate people that on the second grading scheme only got a 74. You're still good, but there's room for improvement. But I would say in terms of being able to survive the exam and still get an A, if you're in, your set, in the 70s, you probably did okay. Some people are just really good test takers, you know? Here's my revised rating scheme. So I kind of grabbed all those people and slammed them up front. There might be a couple right in here that were tagging along. I did look at these carefully and looked at who's who. So there's some people in here that used to be connected with the other group. And I'll make sure that I'm aware of that when I assign final grades. 
that I thought of you as an A. So before I did the transformation. So there's some of this. So again, work through those corrections. Anything else you want to know about? Okay. Did you put both scores on the exam? Or I did. Yeah, I cut both scores on the exam and I cut both scores in my grade book. So I put a star next to it, even though I can see the differential between things. But if you only went up a little bit. In Brendan, I'm sorry. You're you're one of those good test taker. So um, but you went up four <laughs> percent. So so the, you specifically fall into that category. Uh, where it, it, if it's a 99 and it goes up to 103, that's not such a bad thing. That's not possible, I'm just throwing that out. Anyway, let me turn these back. Um, again, I won't be here tonight, but Jan will be here to help you out with any questions. Try to bring in general questions. We'll do another review session in a week's time. And what I would recommend is we get into the mode of asking questions and addressing those questions and working through the hard details, no matter how unfun it is. So, and how exposed you feel, it is the only thing that's going to improve your scores for the future, if that's what you're concerned about. If you want to know the material, it'll also inadvertently improve that, <laughs> which I think is the point. I am with you.
you have to turn in your EM whole works, turn them in by close of business today about 5 p.m. Slide, slide them under my door. Um, did you get anything out of that assignment? Kind of cool? Kind of fun? I kind of like algorithms where it's like you have to do a bunch of math up front to understand it and then you can implement it and use it. And sometimes it can work. So obviously I think in um, the simulation study, probably what you showed is when the you know, dimensionality of the problem is small and the modes are very far apart from each other with respect to their standard deviations, the algorithm works really well. And when you push the modes closer and closer to each other, the algorithm doesn't work quite as well. And as you start scaling things up to higher and higher dimensions, you need a lot of samples to overcome everything. So in higher dimensional spaces to figure out where those modes are just because it's sparser. So it's emptier, so it's harder to figure out where the signal is. So if you download something like that, um, hopefully you get it in a page or two or something like that, then full credit. So uh, I'll look over those. Um, another thing I do with your projects is when I'm looking for giving you extra credit, if you did a spectacular job on your projects, I'll give you the benefit of all of that. So if you suffered on an exam question or something like that, but you're actually able to do stuff, um, I kind of value that a lot more. So I do understand that test taking is important. The most important thing about test taking is not exactly the evaluation, but just the study time. The problem she was study to try and get all this material digested. So, you know, while I don't like tests and things like that, I think that they're beneficial if you use it to motivate yourself. So we've got another couple coming up. So um, final exam in a couple weeks' time. Certainly I'll ask you something about frame morale. It's almost guaranteed. And almost guaranteed I'm going to ask you about this thing right here, route lateralization. Um, does anybody know what route lateralization it is? is? So route's been busy. It's getting his name on a couple good things. This one's a little bit obvious. I think frame morale, the variance of some arbitrary estimator with some specified bias condition is going to be bounded by this function if these two conditions hold. That might not be so obvious, you know, but it's pretty cool. In some cases, you can say what the minimal variance you could achieve on any, any estimator with a, a fixed bias in there, some bias level. Um, I kind of like that. Does anybody skip ahead and look at what route localization is all about? No? No? Anybody know anything about what it concerns? It's about the estimator? Yeah, it's about estimators. That's true. It's in chapter seven. <laughs> we will be finishing up chapter seven today with this, and then we're going to jump ahead to chapter eight and do hypothesis testing. I don't do a real thorough treatment on it because I think it's so flawed to begin with, but I do like to talk about what Naaman and Pearson discussed. I like to go through their proof, and I like to say what it says and what it doesn't. Um, I actually give a lot of credit to the person. So I don't think they said what people have um, taken out of the main Pearson level. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, nobody's looked at this yet? Estimator. It's true. So what it says is, it says, if you condition, on a sufficient step you do better so your estimator should be conditional on sufficient steps stuff that we probably already know um, I should probably be a little bit more specific about what better means it means that you decrease the variability in your estimate so it decreases your, your variability so if you have an estimator and you haven't used the sufficient stat, if you condition on the sufficient stat, you bring down the variance. So, so this says, if you have some statistic, I'll call it W, using the same notation here, bless you, this is a function of X. I'll just shorthand this and copy the same notation they use in the book. If I have some estimator W and I take the expectation of it, 
and it's some function of my parameter theta. So same sort of model, I've got an f of x given theta. X is my data, I haven't denoted it, but that's what's random in this. W is a function of x is. And if I take the expectation of it, it's going to be some function of theta. That's always true. It's not a function of the x's. So if you work out your expectations and it's a function of the random thing, you messed up. So that's what you're averaging out of everything. It's a function of parameter space. So expectation of w is equal to tau theta. So what we might say is this is unbiased for tau theta. It's not an unbiased estimator of theta per se, but it's an unbiased estimator of a function of theta. So that's just a little bit of lingo. If you do this, and you don't use the sufficient statistic, you can be beaten. So consider a transformation that looks like this. I'm going to say something that depends on a sufficient stat. So I'll call t my sufficient stat, same notation we used before. That's a function of the x's. If I define this like this, expectation of w given t, here's a new estimator. So I can define an estimator. So if you give me some jumped up estimator that doesn't have the sufficient stat in there, I can take your estimator and I can define a new estimator. I can take your W, condition on the sufficient statistic, take the expectation, and I have some new estimator that estimates this thing right here. We will show that the expectation of our new estimator has the exact same bias level. This is a one-line proof. This is just iterated expectation. If you don't recognize that right away, that that is tau theta, so it has the same bias level. But it has a lower variance. It's going to be less than or equal. It might actually be the same if you've already conditioned on the sufficient statistic, it won't bring it down again. Bring down the variance, you can only do it once, you can't keep repeating this. If you keep repeating this thing and try to keep reducing the variability, you'll get an equal sign. But this says that this is less than the variance of W. And this is just another one-line proof, it's iterated variance that you use to prove that. So we'll, we'll look at that afterwards. I'll give you an example that you might work through. Um, so that you can at least practice some of this stuff. Let's go back and crank around. Um, what this says is that the variance on some arbitrary estimator, so this isn't a specific estimator, this is a class of estimators with some specified bias level. And I can talk about what the lowest variance attainable is for that class of estimators. And so, and it's just a, a, calcul a calculus problem. You just use some calculus, you come up with an answer. So I kind of like these sort of things because you just plug and chug into a formula. Of course, we need to prove that this is true. Uh, so I kind of like when somebody says, does this match the crank around lower bounds on an exam? Because I know exactly what to do. So I work through the variance estimator, I work through the crank around lower bounds, and I see if they are the same. And if they are the same, then I say that that estimator attains the crank around lower bound. Let's look at an example. And then we'll go through the proof. So, example. We'll look at the Poisson example from last time. We know that we've got a couple unbiased estimators to choose from. In fact, we have an infinite collection of unbiased estimators. So coming up with unbiased estimators usually isn't a unique thing. You can do it in lots of different ways. So talking about the bias level of something, for me, and just talking about that almost means nothing to me. So if somebody says, oh, I like that estimator because it's unbiased, I give you an unbiased estimator for any problem that's total trash. So, so I can always concoct that, so it's not good enough on its own. Um, so we know x bar has some variance level. We can probably figure out what the variance of s squared is, so we can probably figure out the linear combinations of those two things and establish their variance as well. Let's just work through the crater around the rack and see what the minimal attainable uh, variance is. 
Let me just ask a question first. Does Kramer Rao apply to the Poisson example? There's two conditions. Does the variance for that model even exist? I think so. So if I'm doing something with like Cauchy, I might already be busted in step one. And I might say, ah, the, the variance of X bar or something like that for Cauchy doesn't even exist. So that's not going to estimate my center. It has infinite variability. And you kind of see that when you simulate from Cauchy models. The, the tails are so heavy that you always get these large conditions. So if that doesn't happen for Poisson. Variance does exist. We know that it exists. And so we're in good shape. Uh, how about this? Does this apply? So just remember my thetas in this, or my lambda for the Poisson example. So can I, inter can I interchange the expectation and the differentiation? I think so. So land is not on the boundary of the space or anything like that. And so you probably want to verify this left and right hand side, but you'd be able to do it in about 30 seconds and just recognize everything goes through very smoothly. Um, uniform zero theta, frame around doesn't apply because theta is on the boundary of the space and you can't just drag that um, differentiation operator across the, the integral operator. So you can't just interchange those. So we're in good shape we can apply frame around. This doesn't say that we're going to necessarily attain the frame around lower bound. If you've been reading the book, there is an attainment condition and it's basically just the backwards engineering of the frame around proof to show what has to happen for some estimator to attain a Kramer morale lower bound. I'm not going to go through those details. I'm going to say if you can find an estimator that attains the Kramer morale lower bound, then it's attainable. So, um, but if you want to read through that um, in the book, the attainment condition, you can do it. But again, it's just an unraveling of the proof that we will go through. Um, it won't help you on the attainment. So I've never, I, I'll give you either obvious cases where Kramer Rao doesn't apply and obvious cases where Kramer Rao does apply and you just use the formula and then I ask you to, to uh, basically verify whether or not an estimator attains the Kramer Rao lower bound because you work out the variance for that estimator and you work out the Kramer Rao lower bound and you just do it the same. Okay, so let's just work through it. So um, I might want to talk about the unbiased estimators for everything. So I'm going to say that d, d lambda expectation of whatever my unbiased estimators are. So I'll say this is in the class of unbiased estimators. So this is my class of estimators. So I already know what this thing is up in the numerator of everything. If it's going to be the class for unbiased estimators, this thing is going to be lambda. Right here, if it's unbiased for lambda, if I take a derivative with respect to lambda, that's going to be 1. So derivative with respect to lambda is going to be 1. So I know what the numerator looks like. I square out 1, it's still 1. And so our numerator for unbiased estimators is going to be 1. So what we have to do is work through the denominator of everything. So this is the Fisher information matrix. I say matrix all the time when I say this. In high dimension, there's an analog to this. I won't have to work through that um, for doing high dimensional examples. But you can do the exact same thing and do this all in matrix form. And so you're taking all of these, but you're doing all the mixed partials for everything and loading up a, a matrix. So my matrix for this example is going to be a one by one. So still matrix. OK, so let's just work through this. I lambda. This is going to be equal to the expectation of the derivative with respect to lambda logarithm f of x given lambda and this thing gets squared. 
Now, I'm not going to explicitly work through this calculation. I'm going to use one of our identities because it's going to simplify everything. And you'll see that when I work through the calculation that this would be harder to do if I didn't use some of the identities that I've already given to you. So these identities hold in general if this condition is true. So, and you can verify that for yourself. This thing is going to be equal to minus expectation d d lambda is your second derivative log f of x given lambda and there's a minus sign out in front of here, minus. I usually like to circle that and I'll be really specific and put a plus right there. So why is this true? Just work this out and show that it's true. I'll just give you a heads up. It's true when blue beanies is true. So one of the integrals that you'll work through, remember the expectations are defined in terms of integrals, one of them will be zero. So when you apply this, you're going to be operating on the chain rule. You do this, you're going to get some chain rule. You're going to have some products of things. You're going to do it again, and it's going to expand that form, and it's going to take this, it, it's going to make whatever that integral two different integrals. I'll let you work through those details. Um, so I oftentimes like to work through this, but keep in mind, you can always recognize which one is going to be easier because you do the, the first step is just this first derivative. You can kind of recognize what's going to be the easier expectation to work through. So also I can get rid of this, the cap x, which is all of the data. This is going to have the n built into it because I have n data points. And I can substitute this xi right here for a little xi and put an n here in the iid. So if everything is IID and this joint distribution right here factorizes into a product of everything, then I can pull that N right out of the That's pretty easy to see. You can see that really easily in the second derivative form. That's also true here. So I can put a little XI here and put an N there, same exact thing. Not quite so obvious in this form. But once you prove this identity, then I think it becomes pretty obvious. So lots of different ways you can do this calculation. Uh, I'm going to use this thing right here. All our stuff is IID for this example, and this will be the easier form to work through. So let's just do that. So I lambda is going to be equal to minus n expectation of the logarithm d d lambda, two derivatives in here, logarithm of this thing. e to the minus lambda, lambda to the x over x factorial. I can put my xi in there, everything's iid, so then I can drop my subscript because all the x's are exactly the same, they're treated the same way. They have the same problems. Okay. So this is minus n d two derivatives on lambda. I'll take this logarithm. This will be just write it out real quickly. Log of e to the minus lambda is minus lambda. I always keep leading negative signs. So I'll do this as eh, we'll do it. Minus lambda, that's fine. Log of e to the minus lambda is minus lambda. This is going to be plus log lambda times x right there, and then minus log of x factor. You probably already recognize that I don't need my normalizing constants. As soon as I hit it with one derivative, they disappear. So that's why I'm always erasing them, just throwing them away. Writing things down up to proportionality so I can save some chalk. That's it. So minus n expectation. I'll take this first derivative right here. Um, let me interchange the orders right here just so I don't have this leading minus one right here. So let me take this derivative first. This is going to be, I'll take my other derivative in a second, but I'll just roll through the first derivative. This is going to be x over lambda. That's that derivative. Now I'll do that one. That's minus one. So, and that one is minus zero. 
So normalizing constants always turn into zeros. So what I could do is I could go back and I could think about this original formula right here. And instead of taking this derivative, I could square that thing out. And I've got kind of a mess. I've got second moments that appear in all of this. I have first moments. And I can work through that calculation. It wouldn't be too hard to work through. I need to expand, figure out what those second and first moments are. I already know those for this problem. So that would help me out and I wouldn't have to do a bunch of calculus. But the problem could be easier if I just take the second derivative and get rid of that. So that's what we'll do. So minus n expectation derivative with respect to lambda. So this, I guess I'm stuck with my leading negative signs anyway. Negative x over lambda squared. So the derivative of this thing. And then I've got a zero here. So I'll just denote that. And that's it. So this is a much easier expectation to take. So usually when I'm doing this problem, work through the first derivative and make a decision halfway through of if I take another derivative, would that make the expectations easier? And if that's true, then I go to that problem. So lo and behold, we've got that negative sign right there, and we've got this negative sign. So we're in good shape. If this didn't turn out to be positive, we will have known we either made a mistake in our calculation or we violated the condition. And so we've back up. So no problem so far. So this is just going to be the expectation of x over lambda squared times n. So I've just gotten rid of the negative signs. I get all of this. I know what the expectation of that is. That's going to be lambda. So I save a little bit of time because I don't have to work through the second moment. So that's going to be n times lambda over lambda squared, which is n over lambda. So the Fisher information is the inverse of a variance that we're already familiar with. Let's just finish this and show the variance of Wx, my class of unbiased estimators, is going to be bounded by lambda over n. So I invert that because the Fisher info is in the denominator. So the variance is bounded by the inverse of the Fisher info. That's kind of cool. So Chef, that's our theoretically lowest attainable variance, and we happen to know an estimator that has that variance, and so it's attainable. So we know variance of x bar is equal to lambda over n, and so it matches this, and so we say it's equal. Now, there might be problems where you don't know what the estimator is, you work through everything. You might want to check out that um, attainment condition if you're doing this maybe later on in your career. You say, okay, here's the frame around lower bound. I found it, but I don't have an estimator that attains it. You might want to check to see if it's attainable. So I'll leave it there and not test you on that. So pretty easy problems. I'll definitely ask you to do one of these. So practice. The best way to practice is just take all the distributions you know and work through Primorell or Mills on them. So spend a couple hours doing that. Exponential, normal, maybe a mixture of normals. So all kinds of stuff you can do. Should we prove this? We'll need to recycle a couple bits of information. I recall being confused by their proof because they do some weird stuff. They substitute W a couple times and they change how they're treating W. So I'm going to do this just a little bit differently. And I'm going to do this not for our arbitrary estimator W, but I'm going to do it for an arbitrary function I'm going to call G. First, and then I'll tell you what G is, and then we'll go back to using the the term W. I think that's the confusing part of the proof. We can leave. 
that up. So we please know what we're aiming. So we're going to try to prove this formula. So I'm going to just consider, consider an arbitrary function. It's not going to be super arbitrary. I'm just going to call this thing g of cap x, some function of our data. You can think about this as a transform. The two different cases we're going to pick is I'm going to treat this differently. I'm going to either let that be 1 or I'm going to let it be wx later on. This is the part of the uh, proof that's a little bit confusing is they're going to use this as a placeholder and substitute either that value in or that value. And they're going to be recycling little elements of their proof throughout everything. So let's just work through this. Let's just say derivative d theta expectation of gx. So this looks just like the numerator of trig around lower bound. I've just changed my notation. At some point in a minute, I'm going to take g to be 1, and later on, I'm going to substitute g to be w. So this is going to be derivative d theta integral g of x. I'll assume everything is continuous. If it's not continuous, change my integration symbol to a sum and everything holds. So the same sort of thing. Can you interchange the derivative with the sum um, or change the, interchange the derivative with the, the integral? Same concept. Same thing. So this will be f of x or sampling distribution given theta So that's just a definition. So I can roll Fubini's because I'm going to say that um, my two conditions that I erased are true, and I can apply Fubini's because we're trying to prove Kramer out in the first place. So I'm going to assume the condition when Kramer out is actually true. So this is going to be integral d d theta g of x f of x given theta. So this I can just change 
the way I think about this, and I can just write this down, is the integral of gx of derivative d theta logarithm of f of x given theta times f of x given theta dx. So we've just written the same thing down a whole bunch of different ways. And we have to remember all these different ways that we've written everything down. So I'm going to recycle this just real quickly. And I'm going to do that confusing step of the proof. And I'm going to assume what g is. So let's just remember what we wrote down. This is d, d theta, expectation of gx. is going to be equal to integral gx derivative d theta logarithm of f of x given theta f of x given theta. So just a different way to write down the exact same thing. Um, I'm going to let g be 1. So let g of x be 1. So this whole thing right here is just derivative logarithm f of x given theta f of x given theta dx. Let g of x equal to 1 right here. So I just took that g of x, made it 1, and didn't write it down because there's no point. I'm just multiplying it in. Uh, can anybody evaluate this integral for me? What is it? It must be some number that we know really well. What's that? It's not theta. Oh, did you say zero? Yeah, it's zero. So, how did you do that? You looked over at the left hand side. So, that's how you recognize that. So if I take this to be 1 right here, that's a constant derivative over that thing is 0. So it's not obvious when I write down the integral that this is 0, but that's 0. So and we know that by looking at the left-hand side. And that's why we did all of that work. We haven't established anything about Kramer rattle. We have this general result that we just wrote down. So we get to know this thing. We know now. Every time we see integral derivative d d theta logarithm of f of x given theta f of x given theta dx, that's zero. And I can write this down just a little bit differently. I'm going to say this thing is equal to the expectation of the derivative of the log like f of x given the data. So this, by definition, is the expectation of that thing. I'm multiplying it into the sampling distribution and averaging over it. So the hard part of this proof is just recognizing the, all the different ways you can write down zero, basically. So this is zero. So anytime you ever see this, derivative with respect to theta, the log likelihood, you're thinking that thing is zero. Keep in mind what we did is we applied Fubini's. So this is true. If Fubini's holds, that thing is zero. You'll notice this exact same thing when you prove that identity that we used later on. So you'll be using that result when you prove that identity we used for the plus on the case, taking the two derivatives. So check. We get to go. So haven't done anything with Kramer Rao. I didn't have to talk about what G was, anything like that. So I just have a, a result in hand. So that's the confusing part, is we get to just know this. That's another name for zero. Okay, now the proof gets easy. Now I'm gonna come back and start talking about my arbitrary class of estimators, and I'm gonna call those W's. So again, we drive this, not even thinking about do anything with it. Just 
an arbitrary statement. It just so happens to match what happens in the numerator. So let's look at Cauchy Schwartz. Here's a, another thing that we know. So hopefully we know this. Also know, just ask you covariance of two random variables. Again, this is not frame around, just doing something arbitrary. We'll get to know a few things that will apply to frame around. So the covariance of x and y divided by square root of the variance of x and square root of the variance of y. Does anybody recognize this function? What do we call that? This is correlation. This is the correlation coefficient. Correlation is when you standardize covariances. So if you standardize all of your elements and you take the covariance, that's the correlation. And it's equivalent to this. So just standardizing everything. Um, so we know something about correlations. These live between negative 1 and 1. Hopefully we know that as well. So again, we're standardizing things and taking the covariance where else is the So I'm going to assume that we know what correlation is and we know that nothing is bound. This is not exactly Cauchy Schwartz. I don't even know why we give this name. I do understand what Cauchy Schwartz is in vector spaces and things like that. Um, this does resemble it, so I guess people like to call it that. Um, just keep in mind, you don't need to know this name, that this is the Co Cauchy Schwartz thing. But this is what sometimes people call Cauchy Schwartz in statistics. So they'll write down covariance x and y over the variance x times the variance of y. Let me square this. This is bounded by 1. People will take these variances and throw them over here. And so the covariance squared is bounded by the product of the two variances. So sometimes people call that Cauchy Schwartz. I'd like to just go back to the definition of correlation and just say this is an immediate consequence of what correlation is. So we get to that as well. Probably the coolest name in all of statistics, Schwartz. Schwartz, I mean this thing, um, to a couple of functions that I know. And the functions I want to talk about are wx and uh, the log likelihood. So we're going to have that the covariance of wx, whatever this arbitrary estimator is, it has a variance that exists, so I can talk about it. I can talk about its covariance with other functions because the variance exists. So the covariance derivative log likelihood. I'll say this thing squared divided by the variance of wx times the variance of whatever that statistic is. dd theta log likelihood. This thing is bound by one. So I'm just arbitrarily taking this result that we know and plugging in some functions into it. So Cauchy Kramer route really is just this identity. So this is it. So I'm going to take this variance and I'm going to roll this upstairs right there. So I'm going to pull that over to the right hand side. Let me just leave that on board. And we'll chisel away at this thing. Really, the name of the game here is to recognize this is that. So, and it's just a matter of rewriting things differently. So this says that this thing, variance of wx bounds the covariance squared, covariance between wx derivative log likelihood, The 
divided by the variance of d d theta logarithm of f of x given the theta. Doesn't look like that. Looks a little different. So let's show that they're the same. So let's work on that for a second. The covariance of WX with the derivative of the log likelihood, I can write out in terms of its expectations. So keep in mind covariance and variance are some sort of expectation. So this is going to be the expectation of Wx times the derivative d theta log f of x given theta minus the expectation this thing is just the product of those two things, and then I'm going to subtract off the expectation of that and the expectation of this. So expectation of Wx times the expectation of derivative with respect to theta, log likelihood. Definition of covariance. At least that's the way I think about it. You write down variance for me, I think about expectations. First moment, second moments. So, we know another name for that. Somebody help me out. What's this? That's zero. That was our first step. So this is just this thing right here. Expectation of Wx, this thing right here. So that's that. Can you recognize this? Does it look like that? Let's go back. Was it all this stuff right here when we ended up writing this down? This was going to be some expectation of all this stuff right here, but we got another name for that. So this is the derivative of something. If I go back to that first line, I can recognize this thing right here is the derivative with respect to theta, expectation of Wx. That's the part that's not obvious. You have to keep unwinding this proof and use things that you already know. And recognize this is that, and we already showed that to be true. That's what we did 15 minutes ago. So go back to this, our original definition, substitute in Wx, and you'll have another name for this covariance function is that, if Fugini's applies. That's true. And so this whole thing right here in the numerator, it's just going to be, oh, I forgot a part. This is squared. The covariance is squared in the top. I don't have the square roots down in the bottom. So we're just, we forgot to have that down. So this is squared. So I can rewrite this as derivative d theta expectation of w Squared. So again, something that's not immediately obvious, but we proved that. So different ways to write things down. Now we've got a chisel away at this thing, right here. So the variance of this I can re rewrite as the variance of dp theta. I'll write it down using expectations. Expectation dd theta log likelihood squared minus expectation of d d theta log likelihood this is all squared so definition of variance if you like i don't know if that's the definition but it's an immediate consequence whatever definition you use we have another name for this this is zero so we're left with this right here. That's the Fisher info. So this is Fisher's info right here. So the numerator, while it doesn't look like that, is really just this thing 
and the denominator I can rewrite is that, and that's the fisherman. So we're done. That's it. That's the whole proof. So we're just constantly recycling the same thing, different ways to write down that, and different ways to recognize it. So Cauchy Schwartz implies the Craig Morale lower bound. Hardest part of that proof is just remembering how to multiply by one. Any questions about that? Cool.
So the variance of our Ralph idealized estimator is just equal to the variance of the expectation of W given. That's just what that thing is. So let's just rewrite our variance of W. I can rewrite this as the variance of W is equal to the expected value of the variance. I'll do it the other way. Variance of the expected value of W given T. That's our Ralph Black Lies estimator plus the expected value of variance of W given T. We know this is positive. The expected value of something positive is always positive. And so what I can show is this thing, variance of W, is going to be greater or equal to the variance of expected value of W given T. I just get rid of that. And something positive, you take it off, and now you have a bound. So this is the whole proof. So this is the Ralph Lapalized estimator and it proves things. Let me just ask you a question real quick. Where did we use the T is sufficient? Where did we use it? Do you remember the part where I said T is sufficient and we used that in the proof? No, because it didn't happen. So why is it important that T is sufficient? So this is always true. Conditional variances are always bring down the variance of something. So if I condition on information, I reduce variability no matter what happens. That's always true. Conditioning on something doesn't bring up the variability. It always brings it down. So you might know that just by looking at your regression forms for like the normal equation or something like that, your conditional variances, or at least your original variance minus something. You can look at that maybe for a minute on Monday. Try to answer this question, why is it important that T is sufficient? Something really weird can happen if T isn't sufficient. Anybody know what it is? If T was not a sufficient statistic? Let me think about it. Let's come back on Monday and answer that question, and then we'll pick up with hypothesis testing. So hypothesis testing is just decision making between two competing ideas. You can always extend that to multi-class comparisons as well, one against everything else, and do it for every individual. Um, I'm going to tell you a lot of pitfalls of hypothesis testing. I'll tell you what Maven and Pearson actually proved, what they showed, which I think is useful, and there's some insight that can be cleaned out of it. And then I'll talk about uh, the wild abuses everybody does and what they think it means, but it doesn't mean, and all the mistakes people make. So I really wish we wouldn't walk around talking about statistical significance all the time. I think this is the black eye of statistics, and this is why we're going to lose to other fields if we keep talking about this stuff and doing this stuff all the time. So I'm preaching it because there are no good answers. So it depends on what the criteria are. So we have to figure out what criteria uh, Maynard and Pearson were trying to establish and whether or not they're useful to us. Anyway, that's it for now, you guys. Have a great weekend. I'll see you on Monday.